Peter Frampton first went on the road to play music at 14 years old. Now here he is 60 years later and still at it, as best he can. He's 74 now, and for the last few years he's been battling a crippling disease called inclusion body myositis. But he still gets out and tours when he can. He's had a long career full of ups and downs. So let's get right into the video and talk a little about Peter's life, career, and his guitar playing. Peter Kenneth Frampton was born on April 22, 1950, in Beckenham, Kent, England. He started playing guitar at a young age and became involved in the music scene during his early years. Here's Peter in his first gigging band in around 1962-63 called the True Beats. Peter is in front center holding his Hofner Club 60 guitar. He would have been around 12 or 13 at this time. But he really started to gain some attention as a member of the pop band The Herd in the mid-1960s. However, he truly rose to prominence playing guitar in the blues rock band Humble Pie in 1969. Frampton contributed to several albums with Humble Pie, including Performance Rockin' the Fillmore, which was released in late 1971. But by that time, Peter had decided to leave the group saying, I just decided in the end that this would be the best time before they really break. Otherwise, if I had stayed in the band, I would have still been in Humble Pie, I think. It was just I wanted to be in charge of my own destiny, finally, and not have the band. Humble Pie was a powerhouse of a rock band. The original lineup of members featured lead singer, frontman, and guitarist Steve Marriott of Small Faces, singer-guitarist Peter Frampton, bassist vocalist Greg Ridley, and drummer Jerry Shirley. These four guys wrote and recorded and performed some of the greatest bluesy rock songs in the early 70s. That combination of Frampton and Steve Marriott with Dynamite. A quick story about the Gibson SG Custom Peter Frampton is holding in this photo of the group. It belonged to Steve Marriott, but after being on tour in 1970 with Grand Funk, Peter says Steve ended up selling the guitar to Mark Farner, who played it a few times after buying it from him. I never did find out where the guitar ended up, and in this picture, the pickups doesn't look the same. It's almost as though the guitar Mark is playing has only two pickups. Maybe he took the covers off the neck and bridge, and the middle one is still on, and you just can't see it in this picture. I've always wondered about this guitar and the story behind it, and where it ended up. If anyone has any more information about it, please let's hear about it in the comments section. Humble Pie toured constantly over the next three years, completing 19 tours in the U.S. alone. The band would release four albums which benefited from the touring. Their live album, Performance Rockin' the Fillmore, 1971, became the band's most successful release to date. During these recordings, Marriott's strong vocal performances became the focal point of the band. And this was where manager D. Anthony started pushing Marriott to take more of the onstage spotlight, something he had, up to then, been sharing with Peter Frampton and Greg Ridley. Marriott's new prominence has said to have resulted in Peter's decision to leave the band. Now, a word here about Humble Pie's manager D. Anthony. Although Peter Frampton would leave the group and go solo, Anthony would still be handling him too. And it would be D. Anthony who would get Peter to the top. But also, he would leave Steve Marriott and Humble Pie in a cloud of dust at the bottom and owing them quite a bit of money. I have a video on Steve Marriott going into more details of his side of the story. I'll leave a link to it in the description box under this video and at the end of the video. But for now, let's just stick to Peter's story as his business affairs with D. Anthony would end pretty much the way Steve Marriott's did, in a cloud of dust. Frampton Comes Alive. Anyone who didn't know Peter Frampton before that album sure knew who he was after it came out. On January 16, 1976, Frampton Comes Alive was released in the United States. The double album becomes one of the biggest selling live albums of all time. It won a Grammy and remained in the top 40 for 55 weeks. It was one of the best selling live albums ever, and it sold over 8 million units in the United States alone. Peter Frampton was now a megastar, 
and making more money than he knew what to do with. But he was soon to figure it out, as was his girlfriend, and then of course his manager, D. Anthony. Two of the songs from the Frampton Comes Alive album, Show Me The Way and Baby I Love Your Way, were written in the same day. Peter was starting to worry about his solo career after leaving Humble Pie. He had released a few albums without much success. He had decided to get away and try to write some songs. He felt he needed an escape, so he left for three weeks to stay at a house owned by his old friend Steve Marriott down in the Bahamas to write. Well, as soon as he got there, he ran into Alvin Lee and his wife. Peter said for the first two weeks he just hung out with them and enjoyed himself. So after Alvin left, Peter had a week and he got to work writing. His career was soaring after the Alive album. It became life in the fast lane for Peter. And when the label called for another album, Frampton himself was well aware at the time of the pressure to follow up such a big album, especially with all the new material after an album of songs he knew very well recorded in a concert setting. He said, hell, I've got to do a studio record to follow this up. And in my mind, I'm not proven in the studio. I'm stamped the live guy. So I felt like I had lost before I started the next part of my career. Before, there was nothing to compete with. Now, I felt I'm competing with myself. Peter felt jumping into another album at that time was a mistake. He was riding high on the Alive album, and he was probably right. The next album, I'm In You, which by the way went platinum, which naturally was compared to the mega platinum sales of his predecessor it couldn't help but be viewed as a failure. Within a year or so, the total collapse of Frampton Mania would come crashing down with a movie called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which was a total flop, and a shirtless photo on the cover of Rolling Stone, which, crazy as it may seem now, stoked many cynics to label Frampton a shallow teen idol. And even today, I think there's some out there who still sees him in that light and not for the great guitarist and musical talent that he is. But Peter's career seemed to be falling as fast as it has risen. He suffered a near-fatal car accident in the Bahamas in 1978. He admitted to drinking a bit too much. He's very lucky to come out of it with a broken arm and a couple of cracked ribs. After taking some time to recuperate, his career was really tanging. In 1980, he suffered another serious setback when all of his guitars and equipment were destroyed in a cargo plane crash that killed three people in South America. Among the instruments lost was the Black Les Paul Custom pictured on the Frampton Comes Alive. The guitar was recovered and returned to him in 2011. Somehow, it had survived the fiery crash. It showed up 30 years later and was returned to Peter. Peter tells this story in more detail and I'll leave a link to it in the description section of this video. It's worth watching. His manager, D. Anthony, used him and screwed him out of millions of dollars and left him broke and owing money. His career was really over. But one thing they couldn't take from him was his talent. And as I said, I think a lot of people still saw him in that teen idol light. They lost sight of just how great of a guitar player Peter really was. By the mid-80s, Peter Frampton was really down. He was still recording albums and touring some, but his albums generally met with little commercial success. He did, however, achieve a brief moderate comeback in 1986 with the release of his Premonition album and the single Lying, which became a big hit on mainstream rock charts. Then in 1987, his old school friend, who he had jammed Buddy Holly songs with together so long ago, David Bowie called him up and said, can you come and play some guitar for me? Peter says, that's when I went to Switzerland and we recorded the Never Let Me Down album. Then he asked if I would be one of the guitar players on the Glass Spider tour. That just blew me away. He could have chosen anybody. He had Stevie Ray Vaughan the album before, but he chose me. This gave him, as he put it, the credibility to continue as an artist and helped bring people back to him. I can never thank David enough for that. 
He knew what he was doing for me before I knew what he was doing for me. I think this was just the inspiration he needed. And a few years later, Peter came up with what I think was a brilliant idea. Steve Marriott had been playing quite a few small gigs in 1990 when Peter Frampton flew into Britain and asked him to reform Humble Pie and produce a one-off album and a reunion tour. The money would be good, and Steve agreed, and flew out to Peter's recording studio in Los Angeles in January of 1991. They began writing songs, but sadly, the project was never completed. Steve just had a change of heart for some strange reason and returned home. Why? I guess we'll never really know. Only a few months later, in April of that same year, Steve Marriott would be dead. But I do think this would have made a fantastic reunion tour and album. I always thought Humble Pie, especially those few years with Peter and Steve together, was the best. There would be two recorded songs from this final effort, The Bigger They Come and I Won't Let You Down, with Steve on vocals appeared on Frampton's album, Shine On, a collection. A third song, Out of the Blue, featuring both Marriott and Frampton, was featured on the first solo recording Frampton made after Marriott's death. And a fourth song, an itch you can't scratch which has been found on many illegal compilations and even on one or two authorized british releases since peter went on the road at 14 years old this will be his 60th year as a professional musician he needs a cane to walk and plays sitting down he says his fingers don't have the strength they used to but they know where to go when doing stretches he says he is adapted and can still do it Here's a quote from Peter, who I believe deserves way more recognition as a guitarist than he ever received. He said, Every note I play now is so much more important to me because I know one of the notes I play will be the last I play within my lifetime. Thanks for watching. Comment section is open for your thoughts.